Good morning. Today we'll read from Luke chapter 19, verses 29 through 40. As he approached the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Say, The Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? And they replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread out their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. There it goes. Okay. Yeah? Okay. <sighs> Why Palm Sunday? Um, I was going to do a, a linear narrative of Palm Sunday, um, and I did. I did do that. However, it's peppered with footnotes and little sidebars. So um, bear with me and try to keep the linear part in mind as I keep jumping to the side. Some, most, or maybe all of what I'm going to go over today may already be known by you, but the point of these messages, of these types of messages, the ones we repeat every year, Christmas and the Easter story, is to remind you, to prepare you for the coming days. It's important. These are the cornerstones of our faith, and they help to put your mindset into one of prayer or one of rejoicing or just to place awareness into the events echoed here from the past. So why Palm Sunday? Couldn't it just be a part of the Easter story? I mean, how do you feel about Palm Sunday? Like, meh, just a precursor to Easter? Is it an event all to, unto itself for you? Or at least we can agree that it's definitely a step along Jesus' path. But why is it such a big day? Why Palm Sunday? Jesus did all kinds of amazing things, all kinds of amazing miracles, crazy, amazing things that don't have their own celebrations. He rose people from the dead, and we don't celebrate those days. Some of them, some of these miracles weren't even deemed important enough to be repeated by more than one of the disciples in the, in the Bible. But Palm Sunday is found in all four Gospels. <clears throat> so let's, by, let's start by setting up the day. The weeks, this week's coming celebrations. Jesus had just risen Lazarus from the dead. And at this point, he had been around for three years. Everyone knew him, or of him at least. The rumors were at its peak frenzy. This Jesus guy was actually raising people from the dead. This was huge headliner news. <clears throat> the priest could no longer stay idle. So the week before, knowing that the time for his arrest was coming, Jesus took his disciples out of Jerusalem to wait for the appointed time. As they came back to Jerusalem for Passover, having walked more than 90 miles, Jesus stopped told his disciples to bring him a colt, that young donkey that had never been ridden. This stands out in a few ways. Jesus walked everywhere. And we had never seen him riding anywhere in the scriptures. And in less than two miles from his destination, after having walked 90, he asks for a donkey. Also, this glimpsed the mood of the people. Those disciples can just take a donkey based on the phrase, the Lord needs it. 
Like I was just saying, everyone knew him, and the owners of this donkey were no exception. They knew where this donkey was being taken, and they were more than happy to have their own animal be the one to transport the coming king. On top of that, there's a long-standing tradition of kings riding into Jerusalem on donkeys, more specifically kings from the line of David. David, the humble king, the humble shepherd, who himself rode a donkey into Jerusalem. We see that mentioned in Zechariah 9.9. <clears throat> it says, see, your king comes, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, linear thought, Jesus is now riding into Jerusalem during one of the busiest celebrations of the year. They say that the crowds going into Jerusalem during Passover celebrations were 10 times that of normal. I found this picture, but it's actually, I think, really deceptive because he is riding this two-mile stretch. You know, um, picture Bonners Ferry. We have you know, about 10,000 people in our area. It's now swelled to 10 times its size. There's 100,000 people. They're coming in from Naples and Moye, and there's just there's not going to be any room on the road. There's not going to be a silhouette picture of Jesus on a donkey. There's crowds of people. You are surrounded by 90% of these people are walking as well. You're just surrounded by people. I mean, <clears throat> just trying to picture it in Bonner's Ferry. 90,000 extra people just milling around waiting for the religious celebration. That's just to give you perspective of on our little spot on the map. In Jerusalem, it was already a crowded city and it swelled to over 200,000. And they were swelling because of the news of the king. The prophesied king promised to set them free. Remember, they're gathering for the Passover which is a Jewish celebration of their first time being set free. God's plague had wiped out the Egyptians and passed over God's chosen people, thus setting them free from the Egyptians. The irony at this point in time, since they were under the rule of the Romans, was not lost on them. So the rumors were flying. The, time, the timing lined up, and they were cheering for their savior king once again to free them from the oppression into their promised land. They were already in their promised land and they wanted to be free to enjoy that. So very intentionally, Jesus picks his ride. Very intentionally, Jesus picked the time. We are to the point now where Jesus is riding into Jerusalem and the people see him and are chanting and singing and they are praising from the Psalms, a book that is well known and often memorized by the Jewish people. They are cheering and praising from Psalms 118, 25 and 26. They are saying, they are shouting and singing, Lord save us, Lord grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. In Hebrew, they are, they are yelling out in praise, Hosanna, which means Lord save us. And they are cheering, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom. They're shouting this, and it's a frenzy. Remember, it's thousands and thousands of people. Everyone, <clears throat> everyone is still thinking he came to free them that day, to start an earthly kingdom this week. And not just the crowds, but many disciples were stuck on that path of thinking. Even when he was resurrected, some still thought he was there to set up his earthly kingdom. I'm not blaming him though. That's a big twist in reasoning to understand that the son of God wouldn't be taking up the throne, but instead he would be hurt, humiliated, <clears throat> and ultimately sacrificed for God's people. This idea of an ultimate sacrifice would take a minute to sink in. So we have crowds of people cheering and calling out Hosanna. We have people throwing cloaks down and waving palms, which is a thing of honor that they have done to kings in the past, a tradition practiced for thousands of years. The palms had their own tradition that I should include in this narrative. After all, it is Palm Sunday. These people live in a desert, and the palms were a symbol of oasis. They grow huge and provide shade and respite. Palms meant peace and blessing. 
the palm was actually carved into the walls of the temples. It meant it was their oasis. They are used in many of their religious ceremonies. The palm branches had become their symbol and that they were in God's promised land. <clears throat> this is Jesus' moment of triumph. His one shining moment, he knows, is brief and fleeting. He doesn't go overboard and ride in on a shining chariot with stallions. He stays humble, but he's not pretending. It's not a false humility. He knows this moment <clears throat> is a moment of rejoicing. He allows himself to be in that moment of joy and adoration. He is the coming king. He is the son of God. Just because the crowd misinterprets what that means doesn't mean it's not a genuine moment of celebration. Luke 19.40 says, if the crowds kept quiet, the stones along the road would even burst into cheer. God's prophecies were being realized and his, cre and his creation knew it. Everything was culminating in this moment. Also on this day, they saw similar processions from other leaders of the time, coming in from different directions. Pontius Pilate came in from the west with at least a thousand of his shoulder, soldiers to show his strength. Herod was coming in from the north in a parade of his own strength. They knew they needed to demonstrate their Roman strength at this moment when all talk was on this God-ordained kingdom come to overthrow them. The leaders, the Pharisees, and the scholars were not oblivious to Jesus' intentionality, to the symbolism laid out in his life and in his actions. They could see the shakeup in power his life would bring to them. Their tentative truth with, truce with the Romans that allowed them their own kind of control and power over their people. All this was happening in the days leading up to Passover. So we have Jesus coming in from the east, from the Mount of Olives. We have the procession of Pilate and Herod from the west and the north. And we also have a procession, a parade out of the south for the festival of Passover. Back then, you were supposed to have a lamb without blemish to sacrifice for you and for your family. This lamb was a symbol. <clears throat> it was supposed to take your place and you have to convince the priest that this lamb was like a member of your family. You brought it into your home, you treated it well. The kids played with it, they named it. The adults helped feed it and nurture it. So if you didn't raise any sheep on your own, people would buy their lambs, most often from Bethlehem, where the purest and best sheep are raised for sacrifice. If you caught that little bit of symbolism, the lambs meant for sacrifice were often born in Bethlehem. So we have this parade of lambs coming in, <clears throat> coming in to the city from the road of Bethlehem, and the procession was led by the high priest who was carrying the best, purest, most perfect lamb across his shoulder. He carries the lamb to keep it safe from blemish. This lamb was the most perfect lamb that would be saved for sacrifice until the very last. It was the sac sacrifice for the people of Israel. <clears throat> From this procession of lambs, people would buy their sacrificial lamb, make it a part of the family, and then bring it before the priest, presenting it as a loved member of the family, not just a bought and paid for placeholder. And then the priest would sacrifice this, sacrifice this lamb for your family's sins. This is the festival of Passover. Then at the very end, <clears throat> then at the very end, for all the people of Israel, they would sacrifice that one perfect lamb. And we already know that these are people of ceremony, symbolism, and tradition. The tradition being that the last lamb would be sacrificed on Friday at 3 p.m. 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon was when Jesus died at three in the afternoon on Friday, they sacrificed the most perfect lamb. That day, Palm Sunday, Jesus was paraded into the city in a mere image of that traditional lamb meant to be the sacrifice for all of God's people. The imagery of this day is setting the stage. 
setting the emotion, setting the tone for the coming days. This is intentional. This is on purpose. A few years back, I gave a message on stubbornness, how God was frustrated with our stiff-necked nature. And this frustration is justified 100%. But at the same time, remember that our stubbornness has another name. It's called persistence. It's called tenacity, and it's called our unshakable faith. It's our foundation. Our stiff-necked nature is one of our cornerstones. Just remember, it's persistence. So God has to be incredibly intentional, so intentional and so on purpose that it hits you in the face like a brick because we're so stubborn, we tend to not see it. So we have Jesus parading into the city under palm leaves and in crowds of tens of thousands shouting for his kingdom to come. He is being as subtle as a brick. He is practically shouting at these leaders and calling them out. This is the important part. This is not an accident. Jesus knew his time was now. He walked into the pit of snakes on purpose. He no longer removed himself from the fight so he could continue preaching. He is confronting the system and pointing out hypocrisy. He wants everyone to hear him. He spends the following days in the temple preaching to any who would listen. He knew the end these people had planned wasn't really the end at all. But he also knew this moment was fleeting. This moment of praise to the king was really that fleeting moment the people accepted the pure lamb into their homes and lavished it with love and attention. He allowed himself into that embrace because in that moment it was true. He was a, mom- he was a member of the family. He was nurtured and he was loved, but only to be sacrificed. The crowd didn't know that, but he did, and he was willing. So why Palm Sunday? Because this is the point of no return. This is the step into the viper's den. This is our moment to see all these intentional moments collide and give us pause. Today is a day of celebration. We accept that we need this ultimate sacrifice of grace and love. This part's hard because many of you have experienced the the journey and the walk weekends and and know when I say that they do a recreation of the of the Passover and the feast and the and the Jesus going up on the cross, so it's extra emotional because I've been uh, next to it and a part of it. So we need this Palm Sunday. We need this moment of contemplation going into this important week to contemplate what Jesus went through, but also to contemplate what we need to let go of or to contemplate what's stopping us from fully embracing this gift we so casually take for granted. What I mean by that, this casual acceptance of God's gift that we do, this casual acceptance of his grace or his faith, our faith. Um, Let's take, I have this Bible. I'm super casual with this book. It's super important to me. I love this one. I've had this one for more than 20 years. I place it on chairs. I squish it into my luggage. I leave it open on the counter next to me cooking. I leave it open on the couch, and I find cats sleeping on it. I leave it on my desk, and you'll find it under stacks of mail. I'm casual with that book, just like I'm casual with my faith. We wear our faith like an old comfortable sweater with our stains, with its ragged cuffs. But this week, I'm asking, this week is a moment of reverence and awe. It's Palm Sunday to remind you to get out your best cloaks, to pick your biggest palms, and to welcome the coming king. This is your call to worship. 
to prepare your heart and your soul for that sacrifice, for that loss, but for the joy, too, that this week represents. This week holds many things in store for us. Jesus continued to preach and heal. He would confront many religious leaders. This is when he declared the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the week that Mary anointed Jesus' feet in perfume for his coming burial. This is the week that Judas portrayed Jesus for silver. On Thursday, we see Jesus humble himself to the lowest servant by washing the feet of his brothers. And that's the day that the Last Supper occurs when Jesus tries to prepare his disciples and explain the new covenant. They don't understand, but he tried. He goes to the garden to pray and is arrested. The next morning, the crowds greet him with jeers instead of the cheers. And at three in the afternoon on Friday, he as was prophesied, his sacrifice was complete. It was finished. This is a heavy week. But this time next Sunday, we will come back together in rejoicing as the risen king. But for now, this week, this was the hardest week of Jesus' life. And I think that the week between Palm Sunday and Easter deserves a little little gravity, some contemplation, and it deserves our eternal gratitude. I'm going to close in prayer. Dear God, thank you. Thank you for this gift, the perfect lamb you allowed to take our place, our unworthy place. Please help keep us in our, keep this in our hearts. Keep our hearts open to what you need us to know this week. Keep our hearts and minds pointed towards you and help us to feel the importance of these moments. Humble our hearts as we seek you and rejoice in the fulfilled promise of your grace. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song, um, but it's going to be led by a video.